morning, everybody, again. I'm very pleased to welcome you in the second session of today. Um, we've heard many interesting things uh, this morning. I would like to continue with the second panel, focusing a little bit more specifically on the role of education in countering radicalization on all, you know, on all sides, from all parties. Uh, actually, education is a very important issue generally because education bears the promise for socioeconomic advancement for all people in a society. It bears the promise uh, of education as such, insertion in the labor market, you know, a better future for one's family and one's children. At the same time, education is very crucial for one's socialization into society, into specific reference groups, uh, for one's feeling of belonging. We heard this morning about hyphenated identities. Indeed, education that promotes inclusion and that allows for hyphenated identities and pluralism is very important. And often, um, the roots of, of belonging and the roots of respect for diversity, for self-categorization and also categorization by others as a member of a society, as a citizen, but also generally as a resident of a society, starts at education at the early years. I have a, a group of distinguished speakers here today um, that will try to answer some of my and your questions into what can we do more in education to promote respect, understanding, accommodation and combat radicalization. Of course, it would be very easy to say that um, you know, if we have better civic education or if we have more culture mediators in education, we would solve the problem of radicalization or even the, the more general problem of discrimination or prejudice, but certainly there's more that we can do. Um, to my left, I have Michael Georg Ling, director of the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, and Astrid Tors, again of the OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities. I'm very pleased to have you here because I'm aware of the, the very important work that the, the OSCE is doing and on how the two issues that you specialize in are really, um, you know, very much involved with what we're discussing here today. To my left, I have Maged Mosle, Director of the Security and Strategic Organizations Department of the Egyptian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thank you for coming. Jonathan Fine, Senior Researcher at the International Institute for Counterterrorism in Israel. So, two people that can bring their own um, experiences from the ground and the challenges they face in their own uh, work. I'm very pleased to have Elizabeth Guigou, president of the Annalid Foundation, a member of the Assemblée Nationale in, Fran in France, and with a long political career and active involvement in these issues. And last but not least, a prominent member of civil society, Anders Levinson, um, head of the Cross Cultures NGO with activities in over 75 countries, thousands of volunteers really working on intercultural dialogue and bringing people together and fighting both marginalization and radicalization. Now, I would like first uh, to, uh, to ask the general question to uh, Michael Gerg Link. What can education uh, for citizenship, what can civic education or a reform of history curricula contribute to fighting radicalization on all sides? Because I think here we're interested both on far-right radicalization, far-left radicalization, religious radicalization. I think we're interested generally for a more inclusive sense of citizenship. Thank you very much for the question and also good morning from my side. And thank you for the question. Certainly, certainly the answer is yes, it can do a lot. But of course, how exactly? And when answering that, we first have to address the question if education is the key, yes, I think it is the key, but of course we should not think that it's the one-size-fits-all uh, solution. Yester in yesterday's panel, to take up yesterday's panel in the NATO session, there was a very interesting moment when several panelists said, well, while even well-educated, a lot of terrorists, uh, of course, still became terrorists, despite of their university background, and certainly, of course, it was not a lack of education but certainly there was a lack of education in terms of values. So education is more than a formal thing. It is more than knowledge. It's more than skills. It is also about teaching values. And therefore, the OSCE, with its unique Decalogue since 1975, the OSCE 
uh, with its in, well, exclusive approach of a comprehensive security, including the political, military, economical and human dimension, which we as institutions, uh, of course, Astrid and me and Dunja, of course, are representing. Only, of course, if we have this approach, a human rights-centered approach when fighting terrorism, then, of course, can we also bring in the value, the necessary value base, which is so important, of course, when educating people into, of course, not just getting, of course, a super machine of knowledge and skills, but having the ability, in addition to all the knowledge, really, to apply and to live values. Therefore, and that was the question, civic education is more than just education, it is civic education. It's about the values of the constitution in the country you live. It's about the way of living together. And here indeed, I think it is very, very important that we always think education in also in values. Thank you very much. This is very important, I would like. You hear me? Thank you very much. So this is very important. I'd like to turn to Elizabeth Gigou and ask her from her experience with the Anna Lid Foundation, indeed, uh, one of the actors that is uh, uh, very uh, relevant and very visible in the region. Um, any experiences from projects that promote civic education, cultural exchange for living together? Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, the Anarin Foundation, of course, has the vocation on working on cultural uh, dialogue, and it's just the root of its uh, uh, mandate. Uh, maybe uh, one word on the Anarin Foundation for those of you who do not know uh, the foundation. It has been created uh, at the beginning of the... Uh, um, in, uh, around uh, 2004 uh, to counter the idea of the clash of civilization. And, of course, the roots of the uh, uh, actions of the Annaline Foundation is to uh, counter this belief that we, have, we are in a clash of civilization between Europe and uh, the uh, south of the Mediterranean countries and the Arab world, to summarize, but that we, we are more in a clash of ignorance and uh, because ignorance, of course, can be absolutely destructive. Uh, people who do not know, uh, uh, have not been educated, or are also uh, much more uh, vulnerable to uh, propaganda, uh, to a distortion of uh, religion and uh, ideology. And of course, that's, uh, that's why in the Annaline Foundation, in, uh, in the uh, 4,200 NGOs who compose uh, the network of the Annaline Foundation, we organize meetings, especially uh, with uh, youngsters and women, because we think that these uh, uh, civil society actors are very important in uh, diffusing, of course, uh, uh, the um, uh, educational uh, education process. So what I want to say is that um, uh, I was very interested in the, in the previous uh, 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 conference because I think that we have to say that uh, although uh, the roots of terrorism is not, are not inside religion, we need to promote a debate inside uh, Islam as far as we can do from the outside, I'm not sure we can do, but we, we have to help those who want to promote debate inside Islam, because I think that it's only from inside of Islam that people can say that they have nothing to do with those who take hostages uh, of their uh, religion. So that's one thing, and of course, we, have to, we, we are very keen in the Annaline Foundation to promote the universal values. We've had uh, um, uh, uh, some uh, uh, studies on that, very important studies, who show that uh, more than 80% uh, of the 
uh, people that have been uh, contacted everywhere in Europe and in the South Mediterranean share those universal values. And it's very important that we say that, and at the same time saying that each uh, society has to find its own way to, uh, towards those universal values. And it, of course, there is no uh, uh, question of having a unique uh, set of educational uh, system. I think it's, uh, we have to empower uh, the different societies to uh, diffuse uh, those values and to have the right uh, uh, debates between them. Thank you very much. I agree that values are important, but I was wondering uh, whether Astrid Tours can enlighten us a bit about measures that have been promoted in uh, the case of national of historical minorities, the old minorities as we call them, to foster dialogue and understanding in education, to recognize different identities and bring pupils and teachers together because teachers really have a very important role to play and whether and what actually we can learn from these experiences for the so-called new minorities. Uh, well, thank you for the question, both your question and the previous debate illustrated maybe that uh, being a uh, tool of uh, uh, quiet diplomacy makes it that the work of the High Commissioner is not necessarily as known as it should be. Because I have part of the answer, I think, in the very... F we are always talking about the Urbana guidelines on diverse societies. But actually there you have the question of participation, of education, and when, if I may, I, and I think I may because this was elaborated during my predecessor and at the same time I have served as Minister of Migration, so I have been looking at it from the other side and I can say, yes, they can, these guidelines can be applied also to new minorities. There are the important principles that can be really used and should be used and they recognize the multiple identities. Uh, we are, in, in the office, we are working with integration strategies for a couple of countries and we see how key education is there. But here I would like to say, I would also like to echo what Ambassador Sushel was pointing at. I think it's very important that all groups in society feel that they are non-discriminated. And that, I mean, have a possibility to have good education. We have too much a perception that if you are an immigrant, you cannot achieve good uh, educational results. The example that he, he Zuschel made was one in, from Israel. We have others, I may, might say, the Rinkeby School, which was a famous one in Sweden, where the society moved into the school and the, the aim of the school was to achieve good learning results. Haven't we inside ourselves a perception that if you belong to a minority, if you are uh, a newcomer, you will not have good uh, educational achievements, but good quality education. Secondly, we need to have res respect for diversity. This is where you also have a common point. There must not be stereotypes in the history books or any educational material that the other is a certain kind. We must combat stereotypes. Also that you have a good access to education as a, a newcomer, that is one of the fighting the stereotypes. And then I think also the question uh, which we are dealing with, uh, there is a possibility to combine uh, respect for your identity, for your language, with respect for the diversity of the society and in some cases, in some cases, integrated education can be uh, the solution. There is a possibility in my mind to combine respect for the newcomer, their culture, their language and respect for the, for the, na for the national dominant culture. But there are the conditions, some of those we have set out here in the Ljubljana guidelines. If I may continue, I think we have, I must say, looking at the situation now, uh, OSC countries and European countries have lost four to five years in the discussion of integration. There was the integration handbook by the, the European Union, 2010, 
virtually nothing happened afterwards. There was the Council of Europe uh, combining diversity, a handbook where Roska Fischer, Emma Bonino was participating. The integration work in the Council of Europe has virtually disappeared. There might be political reasons why it happened. We have lost four or five years, but let's build on what was in the, in the Council of Europe, in the Ljubljana guidelines, and also in the EU handbooks. They can help us also in the educational sphere. No, I fully agree with you. Um, actually, if I may do some publicity of some of the work we do at the European University Institute. Last year we invited, I mean, we, we organized the workshops with academics and policymakers and people from international organizations, including your, um, uh, your office, to discuss exactly how some measures that have worked for historical minorities can be adapted. For instance, you were saying language. The, the teaching of minority language, can it be a blueprint for uh, migrant languages? Uh, you know, respect for religious diversity, um, adaptation of courses, etc. Um, can it work uh, for, for new groups? And actually, I think uh, both, I mean, all the OSCE countries, countries in Europe, in Eastern Europe, in Eurasia, in the southern shore of the Mediterranean, all of the countries have experience with what we call native minorities, and they could, I think, use this experience to face uh, new challenges. However, I think you were pointing out to something that is a possible contradiction or tension in education. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, of the case of Germany, where in recent years there's been a strong um, emphasis on integration, but integration is understood as uh, school attainment, school achievement, and um, uh, insertion in the labor market. So somehow, I remember in a couple of years ago in a study, my colleagues were saying, you know, uh, multiculturalism, interculturalism in Germany is for the middle class kids. Uh, the working class kids, the kids of migrant families, they just have to do well in school, go out, find a job for yourselves. Don't depend on the welfare. You know, cultural diversity is a luxury. But I think this is, a, as you were saying, this, is, this should not be so. And I think here civil society has a crucial role to play because there's a lot of activities that can start from schools and that can bring together schools and civil society actors. And on this occasion, I'd like to ask Anders Levinson to speak to us about his experience and his initiatives with sports. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to come here. And, and speak a little bit. My name is Anders Levinsen, I'm from Denmark. But I would like to give just a few words about myself to understand what we are doing. Because uh, in the early 90s I served UNHCR, and 92-93 I happened to be the UNHCR coordinator in, the, in Bosnia in the Federation areas. And I came to Bosnia before the war started and I set up the whole emergency and I also chaired a lot of sea local ceasefire negotiations. And this way I learned what is war, and what does war to people, and how does it affect people's life to re return to their normal life afterwards. And what we in particular learned in the UNHCR, and in this operation, that was that there was something that was more important than food and shelter and medicines. And that was that people could communicate. So when we deployed UNPRO 42, it was all about, or the idea was about that every time we tasked a, a convoy, relief convoy, we wanted them to cross lines so we could negotiate a little ceasefire negotiation. And we learned how war divided people, how people got afraid of each other, and we learned how difficult it was to take the first step onto the other side. And then I decided to leave, uh, to, to make a family and to leave UNHCR, but in 1998 I returned to Bosnia, uh, where we were all discussing repatriation and peace and coexistence. And I also happen to be a former footballer, and I've seen a specific football school, not football as you know it or as you understand it, but more deliberate games where boys and girls and black and white and skilled and non-skilled are playing together, and they are playing deliberate games, only the fun things. And I thought if we could establish a football school on the front line, for instance in Srebrenica between Bosniaks and, and Serbs, or in Mosta, or in Pahle and Pratja, uh, another top front line, ask the kids to come and play not against each other, but mix them into each other and playing with each other. 
then maybe if the kids were coming, we could have their parents to come. And we also needed a lot of, of, of volunteers, coaches, local coaches who speak the language, who we could train in our specific fund concept. And it turned out to be so powerful that we, on this concept, could move people across the toughest front lines in Bosnia, that it has de developed, unfortunately, not to 75 countries, only to 22 countries, <laughs> where we are operational today. But last year, we, we reached out to child number one million, and we have had more than 75,000 volunteers in our operation. And we are in the Balkans, we are in Transcaucasus, East Europe, Ukraine, Crimea, uh, Moldova, we are in the Middle East, we are very strong in Iraq for the time being, but Tunisia, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, etc. But here, in, in, in this respect, I think when we speak about radicalization, we, some years we, we started to discuss what, how can we use, we have a unique network, because when we do these football schools, for us it's not so much the, the event or the activity itself. What is more important for us, that is the structure we are leaving behind. And when we can come further from the conflict itself, we can see now it's no longer a problem to have people to communicate or to go on the roads to put faces on each other. And there we were looking into crime prevention. Because when we look, we, we look into crime prevention, which we are today also using in dialogue for combating radicalization and extremism, in the sense that we assume that nobody is born criminal or radical or extremist. It's something, it's a process that takes part step by step, escalates step by step, and it's a process we can identify. We can identify risk behaviors. Usually it starts with isolation from family. It could be school dropout or hate speeches among friends or on Facebook. And it's obvious that before we can identify these kind of risk behaviors, the higher is our chances to intervene. So, third, it's also important that when we come to our countries in the East Europe, that crime prevention and these issues are usually meant only as something for police alone, as a task for the police alone. But it's also obvious that it's too important to leave with the police alone. Because we need to bring this down to the people who know the ch children, the youth, and their families. And who are they? They are the school, that's a football club, that's a social service, but it's also police. We all know the families from different <laughs> angles. And then we were looking at a Danish concept, we call it SSP, the cooperation between school, police, and social service. And we saw that they say that efficient crime prevention that is to build a governance structure, a network between school, social, police, based on simple principles from single sector to cross sector, from national interventions to community-based interventions, from top-down approaches to bottom-up approaches, and from pointed fingers and orders to dialogue. And that's what we try to do. We go into the communities with our football schools. And instead of engaging 12 football coaches, we engage three police officers, three social service, three school teachers, and three sport coaches. And we take them on a seminar, and there we play together. And I think what we have learned is that, that sports can be a very, very good learning tool while, for bridging and bonding, because we touch each other, we sniff to each other, we push each other. We fight with each other, we laugh together, and we know as sportsmen something happens between us when we play a good game. We connect to each other. And afterwards we go out and build confidence to the kids and their parents by organizing a football school. And hereafter we go in and try to set up this governance structure. So this is, for me, education here, that's also about the structure we build, and it has something to do cross-sector, and it must be built on dialogue the whole way through, uh, and communication. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, such programs give us hope. Uh, I would like now to turn to Maget Mosle, because I think it's in a way easier to speak of these issues when we remain in the school environment, but what happens when one uh, deals with the state institutions and uh, 
you know, from a ministry when one has to think of functionaries or even police forces, um, what are the challenges that you face and how, what are the initiatives you have taken to, to address these issues? I mean, today we speak a lot about lifelong learning, for instance. Have you, um, you know, have you had uh, initiatives on this? Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and uh, for the question. I would like here to, uh, to look at uh, religious education. Uh, I think every person needs uh, around uh, three liters of water every day, two to three water, two to three liters, but unfortunately most of us don't have those. Uh, similarly, Every human being needs between zero and maybe 200 gigabytes of religious education every year. And uh, it varies. Religious education, I mean uh, about education and into education for confessionals. Before learning and having religious education about other religions could be zero. Zero gigabyte. We could live without knowing about Christianity or Islam for non-Muslim and so forth. Now we don't have this luxury. On the other hand, learning about, is, uh, learning into Islam for Muslims, we need actually between 100 and 200 gigabytes every year. And when we don't have those religious education material where we live, we have to resort to other sources. We go to internet, we go to extremists, and so forth. This is, for me, the core of the problem. There is need to have very strong links between Muslim communities and religious and educational institutions in Muslim countries. If those links does not exist or are weakened, then they will resort to other sources. And that's what happened for uh, the phenomena of foreign terrorist fighters. So this is one recommendation we have. Very strong links with religion. Uh, renowned religious and educational institutions in Muslim countries. The second one, learning about education. There is need for a regular review of history textbooks. In Egypt, we have established a committee to look at the image of, uh, of Muslim and Arab culture in history textbooks in European countries. And the results were phenomenal. jihad, about women, about Islam, even about pilgrimage. In some of those books that are taught to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of students, they're telling pilgrimage as part of uh, doing the performing pilgrimage, you need to go and uh, pray for the uh, black stone, something that I have never learned about in my own country as a Muslim. This committee has successfully engaged into cooperation with many European countries. Here in Austria, in France, in Portugal, in Spain, there is need for this regular review for the history textbook. And also, we need to reconcile with the future by, by re-examining history. We have a different approach to colonialism, for example. Here, colonialism is a phenomena, an economic, a political. For us, it's occupation. It's slavery, it's rape. Lots of uh, rapes happen during colonialism in many countries. It is difficult to say this in history books. But we need to say it. The truth will set you free. We need to say it. We need to re-examine those. Third, oh, what happens with that? Third, sorry, with different religions, we need to look at what are the cross-cultural values. There are plenty of those. 
and here is on the positive, being proactive, there are plenty of cross-cultural values that we can teach the students. As part of uh, introducing them to multicultural society, but also to human rights. Cultural rights are not very much the focus in educational system. Introducing cultural rights, introducing, introducing religious rights. And the bright side, again, how to learn from religion. Do we look at the, at the history of science? Who contributed what in mathematics, in philosophy? This is also not much the focus of, uh, of our religious education or cultural education. I'll, I'll stop here and, and come back on some of other points. Thank you. Thank you, very important points. Uh, not, not, not easy to solve. I think what we need in history is, as you say, to recognize there are divergent points and perhaps organize uh, workshops among educators to at least recognize the divergence uh, and discuss it. I think it is uh, difficult to expect that each country or each side will convert to the views of the other. And I can speak about this from my experience from my own country, Greece. And there's been in the past, for instance, very good efforts um, for rapprochement with Turkey and for exactly looking at the same events and how they are presented in Greek history textbooks and in Turkish history textbooks and try to explain to the children that they shouldn't look at each other as, as enemies but rather recognize that history is also a way of making sense of ourselves. This is a very good point. Um, I also very much appreciate the, your point about religious um, education. Um, this, is another hot, uh, this is another topic that is hotly debated, I think, also within European societies. And, and, and it's great to hear that um, we can find common ground on this too. I'd like to, to pass the floor to Jonathan Fine to give us his own, uh, you know, uh, views and experiences on these challenges. First of all, good morning to all of you and thank you very much for uh, the committee here to invite me to speak to you today. I've been dedicating the past six and a half years of my research uh, to a book which is titled uh, Political Violence in Judaism, Christianity and Islam from Holy War to Modern Term. And I'm very happy that the uh, Egyptian delegate here brought us back to what I think is one of the major challenges we have today and that is this huge white elephant hanging in the room, which is called religion. I agree with you that uh, ignorance is the mother of all sins. On behalf of those that are easy prey to fall in the hands of radical religious groups, but I also want to point a finger to the um, uh, um, uh, the ignorance of many of us in the West towards religion. There is a general tendency in the West that's been going on for a very long time to downplay ideologies in general and religion in particular. There are many reasons for that. Part of them may be the fact that you've enjoyed more than 400 years of separation of church and state. Uh, part of it is the uh, post-World War II fatigue of ideologies. No believe in isms, socialism, Marxism, communism, fascism. Don't bother us. The problem is that two-thirds of the people living on this planet do not agree with you on this matter. And before we start talking about education and how to de-radicalize people who fall into this problem, it is very, very important to know, and this is not only a Muslim problem. I'm telling you as an Israeli, as a Jew, and as a conservative rabbi. We have problems in Judaism as well, and Christians have problems, and Muslims have problems. And first of all, before we embark on trying to reform or trying to, to, to stop those that we don't want them to take over or hijack our religions, it is visible to study in depth what Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have to say about war and violence. They've been doing that for more than 2,000 years. There is nothing new in the ideas brought forward by the Jewish underground in 1994. They wanted to blow up the, uh, temple, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the temple Mount in Jerusalem, talking about a guy like Yudah Etzion. The ideas brought by Igal Amir, who assassinated Prime Minister Abim. The head of the Army of God in the United States, which is the American version of Jund Allah, as attacking abortion clinics and killing gynecologists. Not to mention uh, uh, all, all kinds of ideas brought today by Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the Islamic State. Nothing new about this. It's been there for a very long time. We turned our heads away from this because we don't take religion seriously. And if we want to have any kind of success using education, which is one step before we lose these kids or lose anybody who joins these groups, we have to have at least the same kind of knowledge they have. 
Yesterday, uh, Lila uh, from Morocco uh, 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 said very like, you're talking about a Jew. You're not dealing with a bunch of idiots or morons. These are highly specialized people who know very well what they're doing. Who know, who know their religious text very well. They have masterminded the social media a long time before we started to wake up to this problem. Now we woke up to this. In order to deal with them, we have to be at least on the same intellectual level. When you talk again about somebody like Yigal Amir was a brilliant law student and knew his Babylonian Talmud very well, although he twisted a lot of things in order to serve his political agenda, that's what they all do. They draw back on historical events. They take and manipulate their religious texts because most of us are ignorant. We don't know what they're talking about. Uh, after the Rabin assassination, the Israeli Shin Bet, the ISA, had to regroup itself and open up a whole new division, not department, which is called the Jewish, the, the Jewish, the Jewish division, not for Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad, but to deal with radical fundamental Jews. Because none of them understood what these people were doing. They didn't understand the ideological level. And the same thing goes with uh, Christian identity groups, and the same thing goes with radical fundamental Muslims. You can kill 200 in terrorists today. It is very hard to kill an idea. And if we don't understand the ideology, we'll never understand the strategy, and we'll never understand the tactics that these groups are using very skillfully, and unfortunately, uh, with very lethal uh, outcome. If you follow the justifications brought forward, I can give you three short examples of people who have committed uh, uh, assassinations. When Igal Amir was arrested after killing Prime Minister Rabin, and he went into interrogation, he was asked by his interrogators, why did you do this? And they wanted to talk about the political aspect of radical Israeli right, left. He said, what are you talking about? I followed two clauses in the Babylonian Talmud, uh, which are called the law of the persecutor and the law of the informer, which had to deal with special uh, problems Jews had in the Middle Ages under Christian and Muslim domination. It had nothing to do with the Rabin Arafat in Oslo. And I do, did my interpretation. They didn't know what he was talking about. Most of the Israelis didn't know what he was, because they've been detached from religious studies. You take the arguments brought forward by the American Christian Army of God or various Christian identity groups, how they manipulate basic ideas in Christianity, such as pacifism, just war, and crusade. Most Christians don't know what they're talking about. And not to mention when you come up to a, a, a skillful, uh, 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 more radical, for example, Sunni Muslim, the Hassan al-Banna side, Qutub, Abdallah Salam Faraj, Khomeini from the Shiite side, these people are masterminds in what they're doing. They know their stuff very well. <clears throat> they know how to market it very well. Uh, one more last example I want to give you is you all remember the execution of Nicholas Berg in May 2004 in Iraq. And he was executed by... Uh, self-appointed leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq in those days, Abu Musar Zakawi. Zakawi reads a chilling speech in front of a video. I don't know how many of you have bothered to translate the speech and follow him stage by stage. Get to the last part of the speech where he tries to justify decapitation. Anybody who knows Sharia law and Sunnah Islam knows there are very many ways of, uh, of ruling fatwas and dealing with these things and how to do it. And Zarqawi is not exactly the biggest expert on this matter. But what he did was something very typical than what all radical fundamental religious uh, activists do. They draw on the past. He goes back to a hadith that talks about how uh, the Prophet dealt with uh, prisoners of war. It doesn't matter what really happened historically, but he draws the legitimization. He, he did that. I can do the same thing, which is a bunch of bollocks, by the way. Ask any Muslim who really understands uh, uh, Sharia and how these things are really implemented professionally. This guy went astray uh, completely, but most people don't even know what he's talking about. And that, I think, is a, pre, a necessary precondition of dealing with these radical groups. May they be Jews, may they be Christians, to study religion in depth and not to run away and bypass this huge white elephant standing in the room. And one last thing. And it's not easy for me for to say this as, uh, um, as a rabbi, besides, of being a concert, besides being an expert in terrorism, counterterrorism, EU and US policies in the Middle East, which I've been dealing with most of my adult life in the Israeli Defense Ministry and other institutions in Israel, and my academic background as well. Some of our texts are problematic. Wake up to this. In Judaism, in Christianity, in Islam. Not because of uh, implementing a mechanism of interpretation. Some of the texts themselves are problematic. I have to stand every morning and read and pray. And some of the things, I just don't want them. I, don't, I have to find a way to get around as an educator, by the way. And I, I, and I know that I have a lot of priest colleagues and imam colleagues who agree with me on this. But we have to come to the awareness, like in therapy, that we have a lot of problems with our own religious, religions in home. And if we don't face and define the problem as it is, we will never get out of this mess. With us optimistic mission, I wish you all the best. Speech, I think uh, we, so we agree that uh, 
There's something about religious extremism on all sides, and we agree we need more education. Um, the question is, uh, uh, in my view, I mean, I, I like your, your, your uh, approach because I, being a sociologist, I look at religion from a sociological perspective, and I do uh, see that a lot of the things exactly that are written in the holy text of the different religions come from a particular historical context and should, should be actually reinterpreted. Uh, the question is um, that eventually religion is also about security, existential security of the people, which is now intertwined with other types of security that are mobilized in public discourses, uh, such as actual security from terrorists, uh, terrorist acts. And the question is whether we can um, see education, both religious education as enlightening people about their own religion and the different religions, but also learning about each other as a source of feeling more secure. Um, and with this, I would like to open uh, the floor to questions to all of our speakers. Thank you. Uh, this is Ceren Serbest. Uh, I'm counselor at the Turkish mission to the OSC. Uh, I have a. I would like to ask the panelists uh, how they see the education of the vulnerable groups. Okay, we have uh, migrant groups, we have uh, minorities, and on, at the same time, uh, we have refugees. Uh, in Turkey, uh, there are 550,000 Syrian children, and only 200,000 of them have access to education, and also. Uh, the, the similar similar uh, situation in Jordan and other neighboring countries. So, who should form the curricula uh, of the, uh, for these children? Uh, the national authorities will form them, or the uh, international organizations? I would like to hear your views. Thank you. Thank you. I'm this, hello, I'm the Slovenian ambassador to the OEC and international organizations in Vienna and I'm a big promoter of human rights education. Um, I talk always about attention to the young generation, meaning children and youth. And um, I was very provoked by what I just heard, you can't kill an evil idea. You can kill terrorists, but you can't kill uh, evil ideas. So how to counter this? Uh, my answer is counter it systematically with human rights education, with teaching everybody at an early age about universal human rights, not only religious issues, but universal human rights. And I wonder what the panelists think, how OSC as the security organization, having comprehensive security as the main issue of its uh, work, how can OSC motivate participating states and partners to fulfill their obligations under, from different conventions, namely even Convention on the Rights of the Child. Because we are supposed to teach our children on universal human rights, and if you look at the service, there's not that many countries that really do it systematically. Uh, of course, there are 5% of pathologies in every society, so, um, so you, know, you can still have pathologies, also terrorism, but much less if you systematically address the issue. So how to counter the evil ideas, how to counter the evil ideologies. I believe it's at a very early stage and I believe OSC has a role to play, but I wonder what the panelists think. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to take two more questions for yes. this round. One is, uh, I thought uh, I was that third. You say. It was you. Yes. Okay. And <laughs> okay. Hello, my name is Rania Mati. I'm a law student. Um, I would just like to uh, go back to a um, concept was mentioned previously. And I would like to start with, shouldn't we educate our, ourselves with facts like the following? In December 2014, Al-Azhar state stated that IS could not be labeled kuffar, even as they disagreed with, the, with them. Saying that IS has nothing to do with Islam is not enough in face 
of the horrifying terror we are witnessing today that they explicitly state is done in the, say, in the name of Islam as we are all witnessing on television today. The Islamic world has to deliver facts based on the religion and, and from the religion itself, just as IS do for justifying their terror action in order to give proven evidence. Furthermore, there is no clash of civilization. Civilizations do not clash, they compete. The clash we are witnessing, we are witnessing around, around the, t the world today is not a clash of religion or a clash of civilizations. It's a clash between freedom and oppression, between democracy and dictatorship. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Garo Shadwan. I'm from the Austrian-Armenian Committee for Justice and Democracy. Um, we talked about uh, different roots of uh, extremism. I, uh, I heard the speeches of uh, the honorable guests from Turkey and uh, as it was also mentioned, and this is uh, nationalism which is uh, responsible for terrorism and also genocides. So uh, this year the Armenians uh, commemorate the centennial of the Armenian genocide, the root problem of which is in the absence of justice. 1.5 million Armenians were annihilated in Turkey. The entire Armenian population in the historical Western Armenia or today's Eastern Turkey was destroyed. However, the Armenian genocide is still denied by Turkey. We talked about extremism in history books but the Turkish history, the Turkish education system and history books are teaching wrong history and are therefore responsible for numerous uh, violence against minorities in Turkey, especially the Armenian. So uh, shouldn't we also uh, discuss more the, na the roots of nationaliz nationalism and not just the religious? And what is the OSCE doing for uh, teaching Right, uh, history and education in the in their member countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it, it is true that religious and national identities are intertwined, and I think Anders and his experience in former Yugoslavia can can tell us a lot about it. But I'd like first to give the floor to Elizabeth Gigu, reacting to some of these questions. in the debate is that, uh, of course, we all have uh, to uh, question ourselves to what are the responsibilities inside each of our societies. There is no excuse to say those people who try to colonize the heads of our youngsters come from the outside. Uh, the uh, Charlie Hebdo killers came from France. They were born in France and they were educated in France. And you, we, can, we can say exactly the same things when you have terrorist attacks everywhere in the world, in the Arab world, in the south, in the uh, north. So for one thing, I think that we have to be very uh, keen in saying that there is uh, no excuse to find outside. It's our own societies. Uh, second uh, uh, remark. Of course, it's important to teach religions. And probably in France, we have not done uh, enough on that, on all religions. But we should not think that uh, teaching religion is enough. We have, of course, uh, to teach values. We cannot reduce a society to religion, even if uh, uh, there is an overwhelming part of the population who have religious uh, convictions. And, uh, of course, uh, we, it is very important 
that uh, to, to know as well that uh, some of thing about Islam, and they didn't want to know anything. So uh, I think that we have to consider the question of the social integration. Most of them, nearly all of them, had a feeling to be a side of society, to have no future in the society, and of course, we could see that, uh, for example, in the southern uh, Mediterranean countries, but it's also the case in Europe, the question of youth unemployment is, of course, uh, 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 it, it, uh, it does not excuse, it does not explain, but of course it's a, a, a question to consider. Therefore, we have to work on, in each society, on what explains that youngsters completely uh, cut, in fact, with their roots. Because we can see in France, for example, the families are calling for help. They just don't understand why their children uh, go like that. So, and I think that it, it's not a matter of for, uh, for, for uh, a society to teach its values to other societies. We have common values, universal values, but it's in each society that we have to work. And what the Annaline Foundation tries to promote is exchanges. Because it's only if we have debate, if we have exchanges, that we can uh, um, understand each other and, uh, and to understand the differences and to build a common, uh, uh, our common approach although we are different. And I would say that uh, in the actions we promote in the Annaline Foundation is, for example, the question of translations between uh, Arabic language and minority language inside European languages and vice versa. Because we, we don't know anything in Europe about, for example, what has been the Arab uh, thinking in the, in the 19th century, there has been a nada. What do we know about that? So we have to, my, I think that the key is in exchanges. What do we know of each other? What do we want to do together? And the core of the uh, Annaline Foundation is to mix people, to put them together, to put women together, to put youngsters together, to put adults together, so that they can have debates on common uh, challenges that they face, be it uh, uh, religion, be it uh, unemployment, be it social integration, be it what, how do we face, uh, how do we use internet, uh, how do we express ourselves, how do we deal with that? And it's only in those exchanges that I think that we can find uh, there's no way to try that we will solve the situation in imposing from <laughs> the adult to the children, from one society to the others. It has to come from inside the society, and it cannot only come from mutual uh, understanding and mutual expression, and of course, about uh, uh, mutual exchanges who come from uh, knowing each other and meeting with the others, meeting and mixing with the others. Thank you very much. I'll give the floor to Magde and then I'll take a few questions more from the floor because I see many hands. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, regarding the uh, El Azhar uh, and uh, the fact that El Azhar did not call, you know, ISIS uh, kuffar. It's it's not for any institution to uh, decide who is a Muslim or who is not a Muslim. El Azhar can say, according to his knowledge and to his fatwa, that. This fact is not Islamic, is not in line with the Islamic teachings. But we cannot give anyone or any institutions to say who is Muslim and who is not, because this is what ISIS are using. They say, those people are not Muslims, then let's kill them. Uh, so this is why there is need for those institutions to help 
educating the teachers, educating the imams in the West. And back, the education is not the answer to all problems, because I got the feeling here that if we fix education, everything is fixed. Not really. There is a role for the state. The state needs to look at all those root causes. Sharik in the last session spoke about individual, community, and so forth. There is a role for the state to deal with the, uh, to deal with the marginalization. Why those people born educated in a democratic country they decided to go and kill others. The second point here is it is very important to look at human rights education. We have to educate people about what is human rights, the freedom of the media, but we need to focus on responsibility. Where, what, the respons what are the responsibilities that come with that? Freedom of the media? Of course. Having this cartoon, is it freedom of the media? Is it insulting for 1.4 billion Muslims? Maybe. Having it published again, I think this is beyond freedom of the media. And again, and again, and tolerated. States need to regulate that. The limits of expressing your views and the intentions beyond that. All newspapers, all media instruments, they have political agendas here and there. Some are within the law, some are against the law. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'll have to take some more questions. So first I have the lady with the white jacket and then I have you. Thank you. My name is Sana Manderlini. I'm the co-founder of the International Civil Society Action Network. I'm a Iranian British citizenship. I live in America. My husband's Italian, so I am multicultural on multi-levels. And my point, that, and the question that I want to raise, is that I think each of us need to look in, inside ourselves within our own context. So for, for me growing up in Britain, and, and I see the next generation of kids growing up, there's a tendency to feel excluded. It's not something that, frankly, a, an English person can understand. It's everyday racism that is there. Sometimes it's visible, sometimes it's invisible. And I think that if we're going to have this conversation, we need second-generation immigrants on the panel and on the podium actually explaining what it's like to grow up in these environments and be on the one hand a citizen but on the other hand implicitly excluded from certain spaces. The second thing is that we have to admit the gross violence that Western countries have perpetrated across the Middle East in the last few years. We can talk about the extremism and, and the violence that we've seen in, in many places but the bombs and the drones and the endless you know, bombing of Palestine, of Yemen, of you name it. I mean, this, this, this has an impact. We have, to, you know, we have to talk about that. Um, and then finally, when we talk about Islam, uh, to me, it seems that Wahhabism has spread and become the dominant version of what people understand it Islam, as Islam. And that's about talking about Saudi Arabia. It is about talking about states and what their agendas are. So these, these are elephants in the room, but I think these are big elephants that all of us have to be open um, to talk about and, and, and be honest about because the problems are becoming more and more profound for, for all of us. Thank you. Hi, thank you. My name is Tarek Al Ansari. I'm a diplomat from Qatar and I, said, uh, I work also for the United Nations Alliance of Civilizations. And uh, I have a question when it comes to education as uh, a pillar that we focus on in our work and it's very puzzling for us uh, since we also uh, tailor uh, projects and activities in the area of education and one of the uh, puzzling things we faced me and my colleagues uh, when we discussed this issue is how to tailor such programs in areas of conflicts and what will be uh, the advice for the uh, occupying power of uh, occupied nations, for example, like Palestine. Uh, and what would be the responsibility of the authorities running the education curricula, uh, uh, the authorities of the, uh, the, the party under occupation? Because at the United Nations, we recognize that protracted conflict is one of the worst uh, uh, reasons uh, for the spread of terrorism. This is in accordance also with Pillar 1 of the UN strategy on counterterrorism. So what will be the responsibility 
of the occupying power to teach their children the culture of peace and the responsibility of the people under occupation. While we have a rel relativity issue here and specificity, there is a difference uh, when it comes to the suffering and the situation uh, of both sides. Uh, so what will be the responsibility? And, and, and second, I agree with the gentleman who said, the panelist who said that uh, media should be regulated if it, if it touches the freedom and, and, and uh, insults the others because there are security uh, implications. Uh, uh, and this is mentioned in Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the European Convention on uh, Human Rights. And there is no excuse uh, when we say no that media is free and it can even insult people and we cannot do anything about it, uh, like some panelists who said that yesterday. So I guess there is no excuse and, and the, the state should act and promulgate uh, the certain uh, laws and provisions in order to, to combat this hate speech because with these kind of acts, uh, it is very natural that the feeling of bitterness uh, and anger and enmity will grow and it will result uh, in, a, in a social disorder, radicalization and violence. Thank you. Okay. I think we need an education for ethical journalism as well. My name is Harold Fiegel start. from Mission Europe. I thank you very much for having the chance to speak out again or at this forum. And I wanted to refer to the paper which was uh, pre uh, prepared for this meeting and which makes reference to the increasing diversity of uh, countries, of OEC countries. And I think this leads us to the necessity of finding a common bracket for the different identities. We have to find common rules. And these rules, I think, are well established in the framework of OECE, uh, have been established for many years, but they are not taught to people, especially not to pupils at the age of primary classes. And I think this is an absolute necessity for all the participating states and, of course, for OICC to underline the importance of common rules. Mr. Schussel mentioned a concert or a, an orchestra. Why does it work? Because they have common rules. And you mentioned a football team. Why does it work? Because they have common rules. And uh, everyone has, uh, knows uh, what to do. And I'm, I would like to underline of one of the speakers before, um, scholars of Islamic background stress that the rules, uh, the roots, the, uh, the root causes of hatred and even more of uh, killings are laid down in the scriptures of Islam. So please, I think this is a necessity for OEC and for the participating countries to have a look into the matter, to read out uh, what is said in the Quran, and we cannot accept uh, a saying which says, well, this is a divine revelation beyond any discussion. This is unacceptable. Thank you. Sorry, I, I, sorry, I, have, I have just to say something. We have to respect other people who have asked yes, to speak. This is I not asked, a dialogue. But if I asked you too, and you, you told can me speak. that I... No, you, you, you can said speak. I, I, can, I can't talk. Because I, I didn't mean, tell you that you can talk. You wait for the coffee break and you speak with the panelists. But I just want I to have take four a people in line. I'm sorry. Please sit down. I have two gentlemen over here that are waiting for half an hour. Uh, thank you. Darinel Rodriguez from the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. <coughs> I've been reflecting about uh, this morning's uh, um, session and this session and some of the tweets about radicalization being a process, being a process that does not happen spontaneously, but sometimes it's a, it's a led process. And 
it's, it's not a question, but more like a comment and maybe something or, 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 a, or an anecdote, and maybe you can reflect on it. Uh, about a year ago, I was talking to a woman from uh, Somalia and one from Sierra Leone. So the one from Somalia, she was uh, telling me, she's like, you know, just 20 years from now, we, I was not wearing a veil. I could go out, you know, at home. I didn't feel this pressure to, to, to behave in certain, certain ways. And then in a one generation time, uh, this changed. She said, like, why? And she said, well, a big part of it, it's, it's, it's at school. And, it, and I feel that there is a, a, a failure of, of, of the state to, to, of not having presence of the state. And that gap that the state leaves is taken up by uh, some religious groups that have a, a more radical interpretation. So not only uh, we were didn't have many more options but to send our kids to school there, but that um, then suddenly uh, the head of the family started getting, uh, say, okay, we'll give you some money every month if your wife wears a veil, and then so women started wearing more veils suddenly. Uh, if you're, you know, they started putting certain conditionalities to the help today that they were giving. So I see a big, uh, uh, going back to the discussion this morning, a, a question about the engagement with the state and the disengagement of the state also with communities in, in, in this spread. And uh, the woman from Sierra Leone said, you know, that's exactly what is happening right now in Sierra Leone, and the government is not paying attention to it. And, uh, and, and that is, uh, I'm afraid, uh, how, you know, the Al-Shabaabs and the Boko Harams uh, then, uh, after, start. And it only, the point of this was, it only takes one generation uh, to, to move from non-radical to, to an extremist uh, society. So maybe if you could comment on the validity of these observations, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, there was a question about uh, bad or, or evil ideas. We think that uh, evil ideas can be countered by promoting good ideas. And all speakers outlined these good ideas. Mr. Yanda Fulidu and Mr. Mosley talked about respect for re religious diversity and religious education. Mr. Levinson about uh, uh, interaction between kids and youth, and uh, Ms. Elizabeth Hugo, she talked about exchanges, debates. What I would like to mention, that uh, especially about religious education, we have little knowledge uh, about uh, that religious, uh, religion is about solution, not problem. Uh, for instance, uh, not many Muslims are aware that, uh, in fact, uh, Jesus Christ is a prophet in Islam as well, and not many Christians are aware that Old Testament is part of the Holy Quran as well. Uh, I recall a YouTube footage of an um, old, courageous Syrian Muslim lady who, who was uh, standing in quarrel with, uh, with uh, guys from ISIL, uh, saying that, shame on you, you are not Muslims. These outsiders, they have little, who are, who are destroying this cultural and religious diversity of Syria. They have nothing, uh, no idea about any religion, about any cultural traditions. So this, this point about religious education is very important. And second point about interactions, about debates. Uh, to have interactions, to have debates, we, ha we should have uh, freedom, uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms in place. We should have governments uh, respecting these rights and freedoms and promoting. The, this is the primary responsibility of states as main actors. Uh, in this case, in this environment, of course, interactions, football games, debates will be possible, which is, again, very important for, uh, for reconciliation. These open, uh, open debates, you know, freedom of movement, freedom of expression, these are very important for reconciliation. I would like you to elaborate more ideas what we can do in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. The last question for this round. Thank you. My name is Antti Pentikan and I convene a network of religious and traditional peacemakers and um, I have a small point but I go back to the previous remark because I think somehow we are still missing the big picture. I used to run an NGO that is very deeply present in Somalia and we work in Yemen and it's not just some groups, it's actually Al-Shabaab that is providing the best the possible education available in the refugee camps in Somalia and Al-Qaeda of Arabic Peninsula in Yemen. And, and uh, this is the reality happening, and I don't see any international organization nor the international community understanding this change phenomenon and how that's going to impact us. I would like uh, to highlight this, this reality. Thank you, 
Thank you very much for this. I'd like to give the floor to Astrid, who has been waiting for, for some time. I'll start with you. Okay. Uh, it's always dangerous to, to start, but your mi mind is full of, of things. I think a uh, concrete question was asked, what could OSC do regarding human rights education for all, as, as is our duty? And certainly, we, we could highlight it. We must, we must use all the available forces of the rights of the child where they have made uh, also evaluations which countries are obeying with. Because I think when we compare what was said of teaching values or teaching uh, human rights, I think that we have a common basis in the human rights values and to start from that, echoing a little bit what, what Elizabeth was saying. Uh, the curriculum, who is deciding upon the curriculum in, in the <coughs> refugee cases? I think there is neither a one-fits-all uh, situation. We have some good practices where the country that is taking the responsibility, if you are allowed in as an asylum seeker and further, the country is deciding on, the, on that, that curriculum. But there is also the respect that the young person uh, can upheld the own culture, the own language. That is the good practice that I hope could, could be continued. But as I said, there is no uh, one size fits it all. And certainly we can see how big the, the crisis, refugee crisis is uh, in, in the world because previously it was the first thing to ensure that children have some education, even like the ch school in the box. And this is also, even if you just school in the box, something to do. I have seen refugee camps organizing the schools themselves. Everything like that must be, must be uh, promoted, because that is also, otherwise you will have more and more difficulties in the, in the future. Uh, education, uh, states, drawing back from the education. We can also see from Pakistan what once has, has happened there. Maybe we could join forces talking about the, the, the coming development goals, because we must acknowledge that something happened during the previous millennium development goals exactly in the field of education. If you are then talking a little bit more in the OSC area, I see too many countries where they have some, let's say, neighborhood policy programs or try, trying to be closer to one and the other integration fair where very little attention is paid to education and to the quality of education. We know that that is the problem because there is not any, a key for some of the organizations that they are approaching, but it is a real problem and it leaves more, more, more space for, for that. Unemployment, as Elizabeth was mentioning, I think it's uh, that is, this can lead to this kind of, we have, have the focus on religious uh, uh, extremists, but it also leads to extreme nationalism in our countries. It leads to football hooliganism in some cases, where we cannot control what is, what is happening. And at least a form of youth work that we know after the school, who, who is where. And that there is a clear picture, maybe for a youngster of a different uh, background, that there are youngsters uh, also native in the country who have equal difficulties. Otherwise, you know, if, if it, they're not treated, it can be that they, they get, get the perception that only he or she is discriminated as we have uh, seen. <coughs> Pay attention also to, as I said, to, na to nationalism uh, and how that can lead to, to uh, extreme uh, cases. Thank you, moderator, for a very good debate. You feel that I'm full of, of these issues and once more, it's important that different communities have the right to participation. Participation meaning having a word, having a say in the, in the, in the countries where they are residing. That we should neither forget. It has been a little bit maybe forgotten. Thank you very much. I want to ask to add to the long list of questions we already have before giving uh, the floor to Anders, to Jonathan, and to Michael. Um, we have two questions from Twitter that I'd like to mention. One is from Simon Hazelock. 
Um, what are the universal values? How do we define them? And I think it pertains perhaps more to Michael's uh, area. And from Yulia Socea, education is key, but how can we measure its impact? And that's maybe both for both of you, Jonathan and Anders. So first, Michael. Thank you very much, and thank you for, for the very interesting discussion. I want to focus not on so much on the philosophical and broad ones, but what can we really and concretely do? ODIR, as one of the institutions of the OSCE, is very active in educating and training law enforcement officers. This is, I think, one of the key areas, of course, because where state authorities interact with citizens, migrants, refugees, people of different origin, of different religion, coming to a place, very often they hit in to, they run into problems when dealing with officials of the state they have been seeking asylum or living in. And therefore, one of the key areas where OSCE is very strong is indeed here in this area of training law enforcement officers. Thousands and thousands and thousands of them, uh, alone in our host country, Poland, where ODIR is located, 70,000 law enforcement officers have been trained by OSCE standards, by OSCE, by us, uh, in dealing with people who are coming from completely different cultural backgrounds, different religious backgrounds. That may not sound very impressive maybe in respect of the light of all the now also very philosophical questions you are, you are giving, but that is the few things we concretely can do. And we do it in Italy, we do it in Turkey, we do it in with many, many, many countries. And I think that is a very concrete step where OSCE is strong, is really, really strong and can concretely help in a better understanding because our, um, and that was from the very first moment of the CSCE in 75, that was at the very core of the project, of course, how can we also improve the individual human rights situation and this is about that. Certainly, so that is what we do in education. We also add, promote materials to textbooks. We are way beyond, of course, only in working only with law enforcement officers. We are active in human rights education. And this human rights education increasingly has to face the fact that in many of our participating states, our member states, we have some sorts of implicit or explicit racial profiling or religious profiling. This is a phenomenon which is happening. Uh, it's not very nice to, 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 to address it, but it is very important to address it. Because very often immigrants, refugees, minorities, religious minorities are facing this sort of hidden or open racial or religious profiling. Therefore, another area where OSCE in the future needs to be very active. And therefore, of course, education here, not the magic key, but it is one way of dealing with it. In the case of my own home country, and... Uh, uh, Germany, the common textbooks, <coughs> history textbooks, with our neighboring countries, and Germany has been attacking, attacking nearly all uh, of its neighboring countries in the 19th and 20th century. Common textbooks have been the key to reconciliation, uh, of course, with our neighboring nations, especially France, where the common textbook commissions have been so important, or Poland, or ne the Netherlands, uh, or Denmark. This is, of course, very important, so we can and we would like to increase even our activities in OSCE in order to promote these initiatives in common textbook formulating. And last not least, it has been said, and rightly so, you can't kill an idea, but you can promote your own idea and propagate it. And the idea of OSCE is from the very moment on the respect, tolerance for universal human rights uh, as enshrined in the OSCE Charter. I, I will be a bad girl now, uh, measuring education. We must be hon honest and say that that takes time. Changes in the educational system will take time, because when, before we can introduce them, teachers have to be trained in the, va in the values, and you have also to make the consultations with groups concerned. So please, there are not quick fixes in the educational system. to one of the questions that was uh, uh, 
Let me say, you can react, but we need to wrap up in five minutes. Okay, I'll Anders very has fast. To speak. Uh, the distinguished member of Qatar a few minutes ago uh, uh, brought up the issue of the Israeli Palestinian conflict, which naturally would come up here. I'm surprised it didn't come up earlier. And there's no doubt that occupation uh, has its price and toll, and hopefully one day we'll, uh, I have my own ideas of how this uh, conflict should be uh, solved. I'm a great supporter of the two-state solution and would like to go back to some kind of configuration of Oslo if it would be possible. A lot of it depends on the religious agenda and on both sides. But I must admit that hearing moral criticism from a delegate of Qatar, uh, when this country for years has been uh, supporting uh, Dawa activity, Dawa money, to the worst of the global net terrorists that are walking around the face of the earth, I won't challenge the Egyptian delegates here to tell you what they think about uh, this. I must admit that some kind of modesty and some kind of integrity should be put in place, not, not, not to mention the propaganda money going into some of the worst anti-Semitic propaganda that's running around in the Muslim world. Thank you. Thank you. Just a few small comments. First, I will thank my partner next to me, Elizabeth Gugge, for your excellent in intervention before. I think it's all about social intervention. And I heard you say that the key is exchanges, the mix of people, the, the meetings we are doing cross-culture on the values. And I think that's very important. Uh, in Bosnia, when the war started, we didn't see the religion at all. It became part because they were distributing the relief to their to the different parties. I'm also sitting back with the feeling uh, that for me, it's about how can we create dependency, obligations or commitment between people, not how can we make people free from each other. And by this, uh, I, I mean, I can try to, to say carefully, I would downplay <laughs> the human rights perspective a little bit. Because if we go to the inner circle of human rights, that is how can we uh, get our freedom from the, each other, we are protected by the rights. And I think it's the opposite that is needed in war-affected areas. That is how can we build up a country together where we are depending on each other, where we are committed on each other. And that takes, of course, that the first thing in the very close community is that we link people up. In the long term, yes, we can use the head and understand what needs to be done in order to, uh, to become dependent or obliged to each other. But in order to get there, we have to activate the heart, we have to activate the feelings to bring people together in the exchange to have good experiences together. So I would say we need to refocus ourselves. If we look to Balkan, we were in an excellent process until 2005, where we wanted to promote peace through cross-border civil collaboration. And then we swapped strategy to economical development and human rights approach. With the, with the result that we made all the warlords strong, supported corruption, and all regional efforts were suddenly shut down from almost one day to another. And that's also my last comment to this, and that will be for the Turkish lady who said, who is going to make the curriculum? And maybe we have good practices, but we certainly also have very, very, very bad practices. Please ever do like they did in Bosnia, where you have the school system, two schools under one roof still, which is contracting the whole peace process and the building of the country. So that the Muslim children are going into school from 8 to 12 o'clock, teaching Bosniak language, Islam, and Bosnian history, knowing that it's a big witch with the president during the war. But from 1 to 5 o'clock, the Croats are coming in the same buildings with different teachers. They are Catholics. They teach Croatian, which is almost the same language. And they teach 
Croatian history, learning that Tuchman were the president during the war. And only 500 meters from there you will find a Serb school. They are orthodox. They teach Serbian. And they have Serbian history, knowing that Milosevic or Karadis were the president during the war. And that is only to cement the former front lines. I don't know how international society could ever accept this. So I would say it's a very, very sensitive question because, of course, children should have education. Uh, I don't know what went wrong, but I know when I stayed there, we tried to fight to, to keep one Bosnia. And today we did the different thing, and I think the school system is a very big part of it. Thank you very much. A final one-minute comment from Elizabeth and Magda. Yes, thank you. Just a brief comment. I think that uh, our debate showed that uh, there is a shared responsibility of governments on one side and civil society on the other side. And, uh, of course, the OSCE is a very good example of uh, uh, mixing uh, uh, people coming from civil society and from governments. Because unless we do that, we won't solve, we won't f uh, find answers to uh, racism and, of course, uh, to wars and conflicts that, uh, that are uh, very uh, in, our, in our neighborhood. And uh, I would say that the, uh, we have to say that the uh, Israeli and Palestinian conflict is really a cancer. And we have both on governments and on civil society to find, to resolve uh, this uh, very painful question. Like my neighbor, I favor the two-state uh, solution. I promoted uh, inside the National Assembly in France a vote uh, in favor of recognizing the uh, Palestinian state. I think we will have to go to that. Uh, I don't know if, uh, of course, I'm not asking for everyone to share this view, but I'm sure that unless we respect each other, we, have, we, uh, we, we assure that each part of the world can have its own expression. Uh, unless we do that, we are uh, completely uh, out. We can have all the educational system, we won't, uh, we won't succeed. And uh, this afternoon, um, uh, Ambassador Atam Atala, who is the executive director of the Annaline Foundation, who is sitting there, will say more about our programs. But the, the key question is exchange, exchange and debate. When, in the, with the Annaline Foundation, we reach with a program called Young Arab Voices, 90,000 youngsters in the southern Mediterranean. That's very important because, and they had the opportunity to exchange with uh, young uh, Europeans. And it's, uh, I think that uh, what we have to promote is really cross exchanges, be it translation, be it exchanges on uh, each challenge that we face. Can be climate change. It has to be unemployment. It has to be unemployment, and uh, and of course peace uh, and tolerance. And uh, quickly, to what can OSCE do? OSCE can help us uh, spread the counter narratives of ISIS uh, and, uh, and terrorists, can help us uh, uh, providing uh, the, the Muslim minorities in, in Europe with the one gigabyte of edu religious education they, ne they need, otherwise, they will get it from ISIS. Uh, OSCE can set an index for, in for intolerance and discrimination within the uh, participating uh, states, can look at uh, those, uh, uh, those root causes of contentious and sensitive root causes uh, of, of terrorism. When we look at double standards, many uh, minorities would feel that double standards is, is the reason for that, being uh, occupation or others and so forth, but we have to look at double standards. Can help us also remember the atrocities that were committed. Last year, there was a decision uh, on uh, anti-Semitism, but unfortunately, there was uh, a decision on, on uh, counter-discrimination and uh, the Islamophobia that was rejected, that could not pass. What message uh, uh, OSCE is sending by that? Help us remember 
uh, the, the, uh, the Srebrenica and what happened there. Help us remember the Marwal Sherbini, a woman who lost her life in a court just because she was uh, a Muslim. Here is what, uh, what can OSC do. Thank you. Margaret, you made my life easier. I don't need to make a concluding statement. I think you made it because I think I would like to actually give the floor to the next panel that has been patiently waiting. Thank you all for your active participation and leave it at that because I think it was a very good message for the OSC. Thank you all.